Welcome to example G. This is the second example of falling objects problems. And this time, instead of letting a ball drop from rest, we're going to throw it upwards. So in part A, we want to go through our problem solving process the way that we always do. So we're going to start with a picture. So we have the ground, we have the ball, which is currently on the ground, and we are throwing it upwards with an initial velocity. We also want to remind ourselves that gravity is acting downwards because it will always be acting downwards while we are here on the surface of Earth. So step one is drawing our picture. Step two is making a list of the given information. The first thing that we get to that's a number in the problem is that we are at the ground. So even though it doesn't look like a number, it is telling us that our initial position is zero meters. And then we're told a speed of 27 meters per second. That initial velocity, because we have drawn it upwards, is a positive 27 meters per second. This would be a very different situation, and we will see different situations where we throw something from a tall building downwards, and we have a negative sign in that case. All right, and then just as a reminder to ourselves, we've already put it into our picture, but gravity here is working against us negative 9.8 meters per second squared. So this is the information given to us in the problem. In step three, we're asked to rephrase the question. That's a step that we always want to take because it trains our brains how to interpret these problems, to distill down the question into something that will tell us what equation to use. So part A, what time does the ball return to the ground? We are trying to find T when the final Y is equal to zero. The ball will, come, will go up and then it will come back down again and hit the same spot. As always, when we fill in those blanks, they tell us what equation to use. This one here is telling us to go find and write down the yt equation. So we will do so in step four. Okay, so when we write down that equation, we still don't want to be plugging in numbers right away. I've said this before and I'll say it all semester. The setup is really the key Part of the problem. It's where we practice the new steps, where we practice the new physics that we're learning and the problem solving skills that will be useful to you even if you don't think you're going to be solving physics problems after this class. The problem solving skills we're building will still be useful to you. So it's only in step five that we start to have to worry about the math part of the problem. And if we if we decide that we're starting to understand this problem solving process and it's the math that always tends to trick us right at the end, putting all of this um, initial steps on your page helps you get as much partial credit as possible because you're showing us that you understand these new physics ideas that we're building together. So step five, we plug in the numbers. The final height is zero. The initial height was zero. We have a positive 27 times t plus 1 half times negative 9.8 times t squared. So let's simplify this. We have 0 equals 27 t minus 4.9 t squared. Now at this point, you may think to yourself that that's something that you haven't had much practice with or algebra is really rusty and you don't know what to do next. And I want to make sure that we know what to do next. In a problem or two, we are going to reintroduce the idea of the quadratic formula. It was in our lecture video and we'll see how it works in a problem. But this actually doesn't need the quadratic formula. There aren't three separate non-zero terms here, only two. Instead, what we need to do is to factor out a t. 
So each of those terms has at least one t in it, so we can take it out, and we end up with this. Now let me switch colors briefly. What this is saying is that t equals zero is an answer to our question. And this is where math differs from physics. A mathematician will tell you that t equals zero is a valid answer to this question. And a physicist will tell you that is not a valid answer to what time does the ball return to the ground. Yes, we know that it's at zero meters at zero seconds because we told the problem that. And in physics, there will only ever be one correct answer to the situation that we're asking about. Often we will see more and more situations where there are two mathematical answers, but one of them is unphysical or involves time travel or gives us something meaningless like the fact that the ball was on the ground at the start. We knew that part. To get the second number though, the part that we really care about, we just look at how could this factor be equal to zero and then we can solve it in a way that has already been using these kinds of algebra steps. So we add 4.9 of t to both sides. So we have 4.9 t equals 27. We'll divide both sides by 4.9. I'm going to change colors again. So the 4.9 cancels on this side, so we have t equals 27 divided by 4.9, so t equals 5.51 seconds. All right. So our step six check of does this make sense? We always, always want to do this. First of all, we never want to have a negative time. If something had shown up like a negative time that tells us that we set up the problem wrong and we want to check on that. And now that we've seen that we don't have a negative sign, the only other thing to do is to try to kind of picture or imagine a situation where we're on the ground and we throw a baseball upwards at 60 miles per hour. That's pretty fast. I think if we tried really hard we could probably do it since pitchers can reach 90 miles per hour in the big leagues. But um, for that ball, it going all the way, all the way up, a really high location that we haven't solved for, but you could if you were interested, and have it come all the way back down again, several seconds seems pretty reasonable for that. It'll go up for two and some seconds, and it will come back down for two and some seconds. So all of that seems reasonable enough to us. Part A we'll call finished. So let's move on to part B. All right, so part B, it's the same situation. The ball is going upwards. We have all of these initial pieces of information. We know that it's going positive 27 meters per second at the start, but that gravity has already begun to work against it when it leaves our hands. And part B is asking us to find what, when, what is true. So pause the video and think about that if you can. So we probably all agreed on we're finding v, the velocity v, and there are two possible ways we could have solved uh, or finished rephrasing the question. We definitely could have said when y equals zero. No question about that. That is very valid. Uh, and if you solve the whole problem that way, you will get to the same correct answer. We'll talk about um, the only possible sticking point. But because we have that time sitting on our calculator all ready to go already from part one, we can also say when t equals 5.51 seconds. The reason why we might pick this one is because v isn't squared in the vt equation, and so it's going to be one less step of algebra for us. It's the only reason that we would choose one over the other, is just to make our lives ever so slightly easier. Either one will work, though. In the previous example, I showed us both methods. I'm not going to do that every time, 
but I do want us to, to see how that works. So part A, we draw the picture. Uh, step one, we draw the picture. Step two, we list the given information. Step three, we rephrase the question. Step four, we write down the equation that we're using. And now, step five, we plug in numbers. We want to find the final V if we started at 27, and we have minus 9.8 and 5.51, and I do want us to use the full unrounded value on our calculator. Because when we do all of that, what we will find is that V is equal to negative 27 meters per second, almost exactly. Any rounding error comes from rounding off that time value. And if you use the VY equation, one thing I'll want to note is if you used the VY equation, you would have gotten that V squared was equal to 27 squared. And so it seems obvious to us that the answer is 27, but always, always with a square root, there's a plus or minus sign out front. And because we are asking this time for velocity, we must, must recognize that we are talking about the point when it comes back down, that it's going downwards, that negative sign. It, it comes automatically out of this one because we never had a square root to have to um, fight with. All right, and then our step six check of does that make sense? This problem is probably the only one where we're gonna see some really symmetric motion. We throw something upwards, by the time it comes back down to the same starting point, it is moving just as quickly, it's just moving in the opposite direction. So the fact that we got negative 27 um, is, is pretty reasonable and expected. And for part C, instead of going through our whole problem solving process, I want us to actually take a step back and think about what does average velocity really mean? Average velocity is the, the displacement over the elapsed time. So what is our displacement in this problem? We started at the ground and we ended at the ground. <laughs> and so our displacement is zero and it doesn't matter that it took us 5.51 seconds. It's still gonna be zero because average velocity is very different than a velocity at a particular time. We could also have gone with the idea of average velocity being the starting velocity plus the ending velocity over two. In that case, we would have positive 27 plus negative 27, which is zero, and zero divided by two is still gonna be zero. So part C is really just making sure that we recognize that average velocity is a physics quantity that doesn't really tell us what we think it is meant to tell us. All right, so for this problem, the quantitative sections, the two sticking points that I just want us to think back to, in part A, we had to factor out a T from those two terms that were non-zero. In part B, we had to recognize that our final velocity should be downwards, and so that negative sign definitely was something we expected to see. All right, otherwise everything else is showing us the same problems technique we've been using, and so we will see that again in the next upcoming videos, and so I will talk to you then.